starting a recording. <laughs> okay, well, I will pretend like you're not starting recording. Now we're recording. All right, let's go. Hello and welcome to another episode of Colonial Outcast and what is probably going to become our weekly operational and tactical video discussion about various armed conflicts around the globe with a focus on imperialist proxy wars. And I'm not completely characterizing Israel's genocide of the Palestinians as that, but like, come on. Um, so I got a little monologue uh, before we dive right in. Uh, I'm Greg Stoker, former U.S. Army Ranger. I'm joined by co-host Mark Wayne and our regular military commentator, we think, Travis former field grade West Point artillery officer who did two long ass combat deployments to Iraq back in the day. Needless to say, we both have personal reasons as to why we don't approve of current and past U.S. foreign policy in the region. So it's February 19th, 20th, depending on your time zone, the IDF's Rafa assault seems to be stalled as they try and figure out how to accomplish it. In the meantime, they continue to assault Nasser Hospital and Khan Yunus and make ridiculous propaganda videos about finding the medication of Israeli hospitals in, you know, a cabinet. So uh, water cooler talk is that they've been planning an assault on Lebanon since they announced their inevitable war on Hezbollah in early December and absolutely intend to invade Lebanon. Uh, from our perspective, this is unbelievable. This is operational and strategic suicide. But the Israeli government yesterday ratified a declaration that a Palestinian state is impossible, thereby negating any hope for a diplomatic solution to these armed conflicts in Palestine, Lebanon, and the Gulf of Aden. And the declaration was unanimous. It included what passes for centrist elements in the Israeli government. So we see protests in Tel Aviv calling for Netanyahu's removal for the return of the hostages. I think it's important to realize that these people aren't calling for a ceasefire or an end to hostilities. A poll published by right-wing newspaper uh, Mariv uh, has showed that 71% of Israelis believe that Israel should launch a large-scale military operation against Lebanon. And this came out, this poll was published Sunday. Uh, furthermore, 12% of Israelis think that the current situation on the border between Lebanon and Israel should be contained, while 17% of correspondents said they had no opinion on the matter. So yeah, almost three-fourths of the population, according to this poll, want to invade southern Lebanon. Um, the Israeli army chief uh, of staff, General Halevi, said in January that an invasion is likely and it could be saber-rattling old rhetoric because in May of last year, the French paper L'Orient quoted him as saying that a war will be 70 times more difficult for Lebanon and even more for Hezbollah than it would be for Israel. And that Hezbollah Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah is, quote, on the verge of making a mistake that can plunge the region into a major war. So there's a lot of conflicting messages in Israel um, and information coming out of Israel. The Israeli war cabinet seems internally bent on an assault both on Rafah and Lebanon in the coming days while leaving themselves a way out. So uh, we aren't going to try and divine the future on this episode. Uh, we're just going to talk about the consequences of an invasion. I'm going to play a two-minute clip from what passes as a centrist broadcast in Israel. Uh, it, it's footage of uh, Minister of Defense uh, Yoav Gallant, and then we're going to dive right back in. Uh, so this is from yesterday, Sunday. Uh, let me pull this up real quick. And... Uh, yeah, just bear in mind, this is what passes for centrist news here. Things of war in the north were heard from both Israeli and Hezbollah leaders. At the same time, despite a week of deadly exchanges, both sides say they would rather avoid a full-scale war. And LTV Steve Leibovich reports. The rhetoric of coming war with Hezbollah is rising. There have been numerous warnings to Hezbollah of what will happen if they continue their cross border aggressions against Israel since the start of the war with Gaza. This was the latest threat from Defense Minister Gallant. It's in Hebrew, so I'm going to narrate. We have no interest in war, but we must prepare. The planes that are flying in Lebanon's sky as we speak have targets, and they know to attack them, and they know how to change their attack from one place to the other. We can do copy-paste from Gaza to Beirut. We don't want to go there. The price for the state of Israel are heavy and are catastrophic to Lebanon and Hezbollah. Gallen said that even now Israel remains open to the idea of a negotiated agreement in the north while preparing for war. 
We can attack not 20 kilometers, but also 50 kilometers, as well as in Beirut and in any other place. The IDF has very strong power, very significant. We don't want to reach that situation. We don't want to go into war, but are interested in reaching an agreement that will safely return the residents of the north to their homes under an agreeable process. But, it's, but if there's no other choice, we will act in order to bring them back and create appropriate security for them. This should be clear to both our enemies and our friends. Thousands in South Lebanon attended the funeral of Ali al-Debs, a commander in Hezbollah's elite Radwan unit who was targeted and killed in an Israeli strike in Nabatia. This triggered a series of rockets fired into Israel in retaliation. In a speech from his bunker in Beirut, Hezbollah leader Nasrallah said Israel would pay a price in blood for its recent attacks. Nasrallah says if they want to stop, we tell them that this strengthens our presence, fire, anger, and effectiveness, as well as furthers our expansion. Cross-border Hezbollah attacks have taken place daily since the start of the war in Gaza. Israel has responded by striking Hezbollah targets with deadly accuracy all over South Lebanon, killing some 200 Hezbollah fighters. Warnings of war in the north. All right. So that's kind of what the uh, meet, uh, the centrist, the most centrist media is shilling out right now. We see uh, Minister Gallant saying, you know, making very stern threat, threats, saying at one time, we're going to copy paste Gaza onto Beirut, but we don't want to do that. Whereas, you know, there's a lot of water cooler talk and we're getting a lot of internal back and forth how, you know, they actually are entertaining uh, an invasion into Lebanon. So I just kind of like open it up, Travis, like what are your initial impressions? I think uh, I think this reminds me of when you try to copy paste like a two cell thing onto a five cell thing in Excel and it doesn't work because they're not the same. Uh, I yeah. think that's a good, you know they can't copy paste anything about Gaza onto 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 Lebanon because it's not the same enemy, it's not the same terrain, and they don't have this, they, the adversary doesn't have the same you know equipment and limitations, logistics limitations, weapons limitations, etc. So uh, good luck with that copy paste, guys. What what uh the, the copy paste thing um. Uh, it brings up the topic of the Dehia Doctrine. Ironically, Dehia Doctrine was birthed out of the 2006 conflict with Lebanon when they it was named after the, the neighborhood in Lebanon and Beirut that they bombed. So that's where that whole doctrine was conceived. So this type of talk is exactly what he's referring to. He's talking about the uh, Dehia Doctrine, the idea that they're not – Israel's intention, I don't think, is just going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hezbollah. I think they know that they can't do it, so it's going to be – in. I, I'm, and that's my question for you. Is this going to be more of a punitive operation, a punitive campaign? I mean, everything that they've done so far since the outbreak of hostilities on October 7th, everything they did back in 2014, Operation uh, Protective Edge, everything back in 2006 when they invaded southern Lebanon, is predicated on what we've said, the, the Daia Doctrine that was birthed out of that war in 2006. Um, it's basically uh, it champions collective punishment of civilians in order to put political uh, and social pressure on the associated government and militants of that civilian population. So it, it doesn't target the, its number one target priority doesn't seem and it's definitely not in Gaza is not the militants themselves. It's the people. Yeah. It's yeah, it's interesting because you know. If you go read that, if you go read that occasional paper, twenty six, you know the two thousand six white paper that, that we all read uh, at the you know at the time, um, they talk about you know initial saber rattling statements in the beginning, you know quote Lebanon will suffer the consequences of its actions, and then they move into an extensive air campaign, um, and then the the IAF you know determined that their their uh, massive air campaign is having almost no effect on Hezbollah's ability to to fire rockets. Rockets continue. To, to, to go into Israel and so then they have to move into a ground campaign so I I, I do think I do think that's what you're talking you know I think that is what you're going to see because I don't think they have the capacity yeah. to do anything more than that I really I really don't um you know punit punitive strikes occasional targeted strikes when they know where somebody is which it looks like what what happened in Nabatia um you know but those are those are low risk right they're th th I think I think actually I only think one of those was an airstrike I think the other one was rockets Right? So you're not even you're not even risking you're not really risking any forces when you fire rockets. So, yeah, 
Yeah, and and what you were referring to is this uh, this occasional paper uh, that yeah. was put out in 2006. I, I'm pulling up some literature based off of it, and uh, just to, in case you guys aren't tracking, um, an occasional paper or a white paper is essentially like an operational autopsy. What what did our allies do, or what did we do wrong, and how do we do it better? So yeah, there's a line this, right there. As as days went yeah. by, it became increasingly apparent to both the IDF and Western military analysts that the Israeli Air Force was having little effect on Hezbollah's rockets. You know, they yeah, didn't work then. It's not going to work now. Yeah. So um, this this paper that I'm, I'm about to read three paragraphs from um, is called um, the 2006 uh, Hezbollah Israeli War. We were caught unprepared. It was put out by the U.S. Army Combined Arms Center of Combat Studies and Inst uh, Combat Studies Institute uh, out of Fort Leavenworth. And uh, in the introductory comments, um, it reads. Despite Israel assuring the United States of a quick and decisive victory, and just to reiterate, this was about the 2006 Lebanon War, uh, of a quick and decisive resolution of the conflict, Hezbollah's short-range Katyusha rockets continued to rain down on the Israeli population. As days went by, it became increasingly apparent to both the Israeli Defense Forces and Western military analysts that the IAF was having little effect on Hezbollah's rockets. Uh, when the IDF reluctantly moved its ground forces into southern Lebanon, the apparent ineffectiveness of the operation and the stubborn resistance of Hezbollah fighters stunned military observers worldwide. Without question, the Israeli ground campaign revealed an army confused by its new doctrine. Soldiers were deficient in training and equipment. The senior officers seemed woefully unprepared to fight a real war. By the time the United Nations ceasefire went into effect in August, on August 14th, 2006, many military analysts were convinced the IDF had suffered a significant defeat. One source held that the Hezbollah's military and political victory was absolute and irrefutable. Um, even more revealing were the comments by Mossad Chief Mir Digan and the head of Shin Bet Yuval Dishkin during a war meeting uh, with the Prime Minister Olmert in the immediate aftermath of the war. Both men pointedly told Olmert the war was a national catastrophe and Israel suffered a critical blow. So that was back in 2006. And I don't know about you, but like looking at the ground operation in Gaza, it doesn't seem like they have updated their military or military capabilities or uh, command structure or training regimen since then. No, that's that. Yeah, totally agree. I actually had copy pasted that section out. Soldiers were deficient in training and equipment. Senior officers seemed woefully unprepared to fight a real war. You know, that was a, a line from 2006 that, you know, clearly, clearly applies now. I'd also posit that uh, a comparison to Gaza is obviously useful because that's their current military. But I think a comparison to Ukraine, uh, given the terrain and the equipment being used in a mostly mech force on one side and a mostly light force on the other side, but heavily armed with anti-tank missiles, um, you know, that that to me, that, that, that looks, you know, it's current war in Ukraine because you added drones to the mix, right? That's the biggest change in 06. Um, Land-based, you know, anti-tank missiles, existed in 06, but the big difference was drone technology and how, you know, ubiquitous it was. And so I think you, you, you end up with a battlefield that looks a lot more like, you, you know, Russia trying to invade Ukraine than, than anything else. With, with the added complication of um, a, a massive reinforced tunnel system in southern Lebanon. Yeah, and open supply lines, because that's the, one of the major differences, right? Gaza, Gaza doesn't have open supply lines. They're fighting off of stores and what they can move in, you know, real time, which is probably drastically reduced from normal um you know Hezbollah doesn't have that problem I was also uh looking into uh, the effectiveness that Hamas is having right now in Gaza with the RPGs you know the Ka Kassim uh, the, Yas the Yasin RPGs they have a dual yeah. uh, dual explosion penetration phases so this has been extremely effective in Gaza and we're seeing video footage of you know like the ones that Greg posts of just the uh, the effectiveness of these $200 uh, RPGs. Now that's in Gaza with $200. Now you're looking at the weaponry that Hezbollah has. That's what I kind of want to go into. Like they have, I've been looking into, they have the Fahir, the Zelzal rockets, the Fada 110s, and the C-802 anti-ship cruise missiles. Not to mention what types of drones they have. And the, the drones part is kind of unknown because we only know what officially our Iran has, but then there's also you combine that with the commercial availability of drones and the way to retrofit like we're seeing in in Ukraine. So, you know, 
that extra element is is just it's completely unknown. Like we don't know Hezbollah's capability, and we have to assume it's a thousand times more effective than what Hamas has. And we see how that effective, how the, how those you know rudimentary techniques are being used in Gaza effectively. Yeah, I think it's a great point. So you know, one thing to to do a comparison on there is you're talking about the you know the the Al Yassin tandem you know RPG. Well, the range on that thing's in the in the hundreds of meters, and the yeah. engagement range that they're that they're using is you know typically from the video is what somewhere between ninety to I don't know one hundred fifty looks like to me here at the ballpark. Yeah. To your point, Hezbollah is heavily armed with you know things like the the, the well NATO calls it the spigot, you know. Um, anti-tank missiles and the range on those is four to ten kilometers uh this is these are some of the missiles that they've actually as well as actually been using to to, to strike uh, iron dome radar sites and things like that because they're you know being anti-tank missiles they're low flying and flat they don't actually get picked up by iron dome or an anti-mortar anti-rocket system but you know yeah. they've got those they've got them in preset dug in positions undoubtedly and their engagement range is going to be four to ten k not 90 to 150 meters you know it's a yeah. huge huge difference and the yield on those is also way higher than, than a shoulder launched, you know, weapon. Now, the I've also heard that the, in the recent attacks from Hezbollah, I think it was a few months ago, they launched rockets into Israel and it took multiple Patriot missiles to take down one. Right. And they realized that the uh, the cost, the cost of one Patriot missile is, you know, obviously in the millions compared to in the you know tens of thousands that they're shooting that from. So I'm thinking all they would have to do is to fire a barrage of Katusha rockets, overload the Iron Dome, uh, and then soften up the defense, or possibly deplete the Iron Dome. It's it's very possible, and then to allow the more expensive, you know, heavy weaponry to fly in, like it would be guided, guided cruise missiles or even you know drones. Well, yeah, yeah I, I actually I, think Travis Travis could talk more about air defense and how to yeah. overwhelm that. Than no, that, that's exactly. I mean, that's exactly what you do. That's you know, that's exactly how um, it's. You know, it, this is and this is ubiquitous across air defense uh, attack. So, like, if you look at Ukraine, when when Ukraine struck uh, that, you know, the Russian capital ship, um, what's one of one of the ways that they were able to overwhelm that ship's air defense was they swarmed it with stuff. They they had drones flying around, and, and the air defense systems on that Russian ship were engaging a bunch of stuff that didn't matter. You know, meanwhile, the actual strike was coming. You know, on the surface, uh, you know, a, sea, a seaborne drone, um, and so that's that's exactly how you do it. Um, the interceptor, the Iron Dome interceptor, is a, is cheaper than is cheaper than Patriot, but it's still way more ex, way more expensive than the stuff it's shooting down. Yeah, uh, to your point, yeah. Um, and, and overwhelming that system is that that's how you do it. It has a limited rearm rate, as all air defense systems do. And if you make it engage enough targets, you know, uh, you flooded the zone. Stuff's gonna get through. There are things that get through because when you set up air defense systems like that, you typically tell them protect this area, ignore this area. So if I have like a yeah. vacant lot with nothing in it, I'll let that rocket through. So every every strike that gets through isn't necessarily a success, but overwhelming the system is 100% the way to defeat it, yeah. Yeah. Now, what, can you speak on any particular weaponry that Hezbollah possibly has that, let's say, Katusha rockets, take them for example. Let's say they use those to overload the system because they're cheap and they get through. Or, you know, um, and they have quite a bit of range, a decent amount of range. What would be the secondary wave that they would possibly fire in? I'd have to go pull them up, but there, you know, there are a category. There are a category of I don't know that they're true theater ballistic missiles. Will be called TBMs. TBMs. Um, so, like the difference would be like if you think for NATO weaponry, you got HIMARS, which is you know a rocket system, but that same HIMARS platform can also fire an ATACMS, which is a theater ballistic missile, like 500 kilometer range. Right. You know, much bigger deal. I don't. I'd have to go look at that their capabilities on that. I will say the. I think the biggest difference. Capability wise, that they have is they have way more anti air. Uh, yeah, you know, Hamas is anti air is limited, very limited to to man pads, shoulder fired, um, you know, stinger like systems. Obviously, they're not they're not NATO manufactured, but Hezbollah is not. Um, I was actually yeah. looking the other day. They've got the the loitering the loitering anti air drones. Yes. That, that Iran has, which they basically just sit up there and fly around and wait for an aerial target, um, among other things. I think that's a huge capacity difference. That's a good point, though. There, there would be something coming. You think there would be something larger and more accurate coming after you depleted the system's ADA? Uh, well, I would think I would think the Zelzal missiles, right? Yeah. So the Zelzals and the Fata one tens. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, according to um, a uh, 
internal uh, Israeli study done out of a, a think tank at Reichman University's Inter Institute for Counterterrorism, which is like a fancy private university in uh, Israel. Um, 100 senior military and government officials participated in this report, and it's not it doesn't look good for what would happen. Uh, it's it's not a hopeful prognosis for the opening moves of a campaign against Hezbollah. Quoting this article on Calculus, which is a startup uh, and tech magazine uh, publication in Israel, it says, quote, Israel's war from the north will begin with a massive and destructive barrage of Hezbollah rockets nearly all across the country. The rocket fire will be intense, ranging from 2,500 to 3,000 launches per day, and again, this is from the Israeli military study, including less accurate rockets and precise long range missiles. Periodically, Hezbollah will concentrate its efforts launching massive barrages towards a single target area, um, a major IDF base or a city in the densely populated center of the country, which will be subjected to hundreds of daily rockets. In the early stages of the conflict, um, Terrorist organizations, all Iranian proxies from across the region, will join Hezbollah, pro-Iranian militias in Syria and Iraq, Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza, the Houthis in Yemen. I mean, they've kind of uh, anticipated in a reverse way how this has gone down. The Houthis got involved first before, you know, but... Uh, Anyways, including thousands of casualties on both front lines and the home front, causing public panic, a central objective of the multi-front attack will be to collapse the IDF's air defense systems, which we just talked about. Um, Precision-guided munitions and low-signature weapons, such as loitering munitions, the loitering mm -hmm. drones that you talked about, drones, standoff missiles, will attempt to physically strike and destroy Iron Dome batteries. Um, yeah. Yeah, indiscriminate fire will be directed towards hangars storing F-16, F-35, and F-15 planes, destroying Israeli uh, military air forces, uh, air superiority capabilities. Um, missiles will be aimed at critical infrastructure, including power plants, electricity, the water desalination and transmission facilities. The seaports of, uh, seaports of Haifa and Ashdod will be paralyzed, impacting international trade. Dozens of Iranian-made suicide drones will fly very low to altitudes towards high-quality targets. Uh, IDF emergency warehouses. And yeah, it goes on. It's not, it's not a hopeful prognosis. And so, you know, yeah. this, a lot of um, senior uh, IDF military officers contributed to this. And yeah. the fact that they're actively planning this and, you know, actually doing a lot of saber rattling around this is kind of mystifying. I, I, I yeah I don't buy it personally I, I think it's I think it's um I think it's you know I think it's acting I think they're going to continue to do a few you know, handful of punitive strikes but they're not going to try I don't think they're going to try to up the ante or, or, or really escalate um, just because to that to that point it, it would be so stupid militarily uh, it makes no sense I mean it hasn't stopped them before yeah. but you know. Well, I mean, you could say the same thing about Ra uh, Rafa, but yesterday BB said that uh, if they don't assault Rafa and clear Rafa, they lose the war. Yeah. So, so they've got this massive sunk cost fallacy going on. It's like we've already spent this much time, resources, lost so many people, our credibility has been degraded in the world stage. Like, if we don't win outright against all of our enemies, um, yeah, they're, they're seeing it and they're framing it as a loss, which they can't do. This kind of reminds me of like the stay the course campaign during the Iraq war, during the Bush presidency. When was that? That's another. Oh, I, I was just saying this kind of this sunk. Yeah, no, no, I heard, I heard, I heard you said, sorry, when, the Bush when was it? I don't remember what years that refers to. Oh, the stay the course. Um, I think this was like 2005 to seven. Yeah. Okay. So it's pre-surge. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm Googling it right now. Okay. Yeah. And I guess the surge came after that. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Cause the, sur the, surge by, was by, the surge was a drastic change in tactics, uh, from, from the previous years. I mean, to a sane person, what you're saying, Travis, makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, we've so seen think... what's happening in Gaza to be completely suicidal. Like, I'm just witnessing the tactics used in Gaza. It tells me a lot about the command structure and how they view their soldiers. And it's less, it's less like obviously how American, how American, you know, command. Uh, no, command it's a good, it's a good point. Yeah. 
like they're they're treating their soldiers much like Russia uses their soldiers, like sends them at cannon fodder, uh, like they're using in Gaza. They're just using bad tactics. They're sending them out without combined arms, like Greg has pointed out. So, I mean, it's kind of like all bets are off at this point with what the command is is willing to do for their own soldiers, and we just we see that on the ground yeah. in Gaza. So, yeah, it's I, almost like, it's almost like they both use conscription. You know? Yeah, and, and it's almost like they don't care about their soldiers. Like, they don't care about how many soldiers they lose because I'm hearing reports from friends who live in Israel saying that the bodies coming in from Gaza are way higher. The death toll has to be way higher than what they're reporting. And this is from doctors who work in Israeli hospitals yeah. over there. So I'm I'm not putting it past them for them to do something suicidal like this. And the question I'm, is... I'm, I'm literally curious about the capability because, to your, you know, to your, to your point... We, we, we talked about this before, like the difficulty in replacing damaged, you know, mech systems, right? Like when you have a hole penetration, that's not like you're not patching a track and sending that thing back out, right? You have to do a serious repair uh, to fix a tank that's been hit with a, you know, a, a yeah. tandem RPG or an EFP or something like that. That thing is not going to be NMC. That thing's not going to be mission capable, you know, anytime soon. But uh, the the double the double piece of that is that crew's also dead or or wounded. And yeah. so when you've been when you've been taking you know, since October, you've been taking constant attrition of vehicles and manpower, you know, even if your command is, is, uh, unreasonable or, or insane is, you know, which I do, I do agree with you that, that, you know, that math, that math, that math makes sense or it doesn't make sense. Um, you know, how do you, how do you prosecute a land, a, a second land invasion against a harder adversary, right? Right. In terrain you don't own. Like that, you're gonna. It's gonna be way, way worse. And I, mm. I would argue, I, I'm not convinced they have the capability to push over that line. Well, they uh, definitely don't. I mean, judging from I was, judging from the uh, war in 2006, um, you had a massive intelligence failure. They yeah. were told by higher intelligence, special forces units were saying, Israeli special forces were saying that we were expecting some ragtag guerrilla fighting, couple of AKs, and then they ex uh, discovered a very sophisticated tunnel network with you know points uh, ad advantageous points of cover where they can just sneak in and out and and so they were completely caught off guard and that was a massive intelligence failure which we were always told that israel is superior and next to none yeah. so the question is and i have is are we going to see a similar intelligence failure like we did in 2006. yeah it, it's you interesting because the paper greg well, just quoted i think is what from what year that it was, internal it was study? a year after oh it seven was, okay it, it, yeah it, yeah yeah, no. So um, you're talking about an intelligence failure. We've already we've already seen an intelligence failure on yeah. October seventh. It, yeah. it was the biggest fucking shit show of an intelligence failure that you can. I'm have. ignoring that for a second. That... Yeah, no, no, no. But we need to talk about it because <laughs> no, we it's do. directly we do. It, it's directly affecting their decision making process right now. Um, yep. They were warned by Egypt. They were warned by the CIA. They were warned by their own internal sources. Uh, they were. You know, the military command echelon was given a report and they're just like, oh, we've dehumanized them for so long that these human animals can't possibly um, give us a bloody nose. And that's exactly what happened. Now, the problem with this is that Israel has relied on what they would cons uh, call deterrence, deterrence capacity. The, uh, the the idea that they are such an indomitable military, that they're the Mossad and Shin Bet are intelligence organizations that are om omniscient, that they know everything. Well, that kept a lot of people in fear for a while. You know, that we the propaganda had been built up so long, over so many years, Hollywood was backing it. Um, yeah. uh, the, like people in the Middle East, they they started yeah. to believe it even though they knew the truth uh i was and it, you know, and it was reinforced by actions it was reinforced by your occasional like crazy operation like what happened with the uh the automated machine gun ran by a uh, right remotely in iran when they took out the uh, nuclear scientist when he was coming back from vacation so they in the in the assassination of certain people in like dubai mm -hmm. so these events happen that give the impression that this is an overall picture of how how sophisticated they are but are they just kind of tokens being used to kind right. of paint. Well, I, I mean, I think like 2006, 2014, those c catastrophic operations followed by a massive media and propaganda push to portray an image of Israeli victory and Islamist defeat 
basically yep. tells you all, all you really need to know. But but now they're struggling because a lot of their safety was built off of this deterrence capacity. The image and the fear inspired by their lion of a military. I mean, they they, they love the lion. I, I don't, I've, all, I've always felt like they were more comparable to Russia or Eastern Bloc, uh, Eastern Bloc countries, Eastern Bloc militaries, Eastern Bloc you know ways of political thought. Than they, than they ever were to the Western NATO. I, I think they've always had, to me, they've always had more similarities because you see this, you see the exact same kind of thing. What were, what were we all saying, you know, 30 days into the Ukraine invasion? This is the Russian army? Holy shit, this can't be the real Russian army. Where's the real Russian army? You know, that's that's what, yeah. we, were all, that's what we were all saying to each other. Who are these guys? Where's the real Russian army that, you know, that we trained to fight for 20 years that's supposed to be just as good as us? Yeah. You know, I, no, and, and so, so, so now Israel's... Uh, flailing right uh they don't know how to get this deterrence capacity uh, about their military about their intelligence apparatus that's kept them safe and they need to get it back and the only way they can get it back is by defeating hamas and hezbollah which cannot happen so it, it seems like they're backed into a corner and it's really hard to determine what they will and won't do at this point yeah well what i would say like the only conclusion that i can come up with uh, it's either two options. They're going to send in their military forces in a suicide operation, or they're simply going to make the civilians suffer. They're just, they're just going to attack the civilian infrastructure and really enact the Dehia doctrine. Like it's where it's just going to focus around the Dehia doctrine, causing, hoping maybe to cause some type of, um, you know, disdain in the population of Lebanon to put pressure on Hezbollah, which that's not going to happen. We know that's not going to be effective because Hezbollah is going to keep on fighting. So, and that's it, the, it that's all I see. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It just it just creates more enemies and more international condemnation and more isolation for Israel. So it's literally it's almost as if the people who are running Israel do not care anything about Israel security at all. You know, so even from a pro Israel well, no. perspective, if you came from that, you're like, what the fuck are you doing? What are you yeah. what are you doing to us? What 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 are you putting us in? Or, or if, yeah. if you care, if you care about your own security, none of the none of the moves you've made in the last year make any make any sense at all. Right. So I can't come up with any conclusion about that other yeah. than the fact that this is just psychotic. It's just the results of what you have when you have a fanatical, uh, fanatical right wing government installed that's not willing to move. And they're just they're they're going in it from some type of uh, maybe maybe they really are like right wing religious nutjobs where they think I, that I, they're going to get. Glory. I think it's I think they're, I think they are still playing a balance. Like, so, you know, how many yeah. total strikes on Lebanon? We, we had the two recently, but in, in, in general, it's been mostly shot back and forth in zones that are not they're not military but they've got you know some kind of unit operating in them until recently this was this was like a you know an escalation but i i feel like they're still trying to play the balancing act of shooting back but not actually escalating again maybe i'm giving them way too much credit for you know same decision making but yeah. i think one point we, we have to acknowledge is like i don't think you know, even nut jobs like uh, Ben Gavir are part of some death cult. I think BB um, has basically just tied the continuance of this war to his existential security. As long as as long as he's pushing this thing, um, he's safe from he prosecution. Stays in power. He stays in power. Also, uh, so I think he's basically just treading water, looking for an opportunity to escape. And he's gone back and he's appealed to the far right, not like Ben Gavir and uh, Smotridge and all these fascist AF ministers, not because it's the smart move, but because it's habit. That's where he's drawn his base to, from and, and his power base from is from the far right. But then again, they're not it's not the most stable, loyal constituency, really. And those ministers, he's absolutely beholden to them. So to, to think, to see that he's this supreme leader who's invulnerable, even from his own ministers, I think is, is something that has to be taken into consideration. No, and gov governments being held hostage uh, by, by their far right elements is not, not exactly an unusual thing right now. Um, can point out more than a few pieces of that going <laughs> But on. you would never know that. Yeah. You would never know that looking at, the is like the situation on the ground amongst Israeli citizens because the way it's being reported to us through polling, official polling from Israel is that Israelis are supporting all this, which I I call into question those polls. Obviously, I think it's a form of propaganda, uh, but and but that's kind of like a, a, a million dollar question, right? Well, there's also a, there's a heavy domestic 
there's a heavy domestic angle to their pr propaganda as well. You know. Yeah. No doubt. From, from a very early age. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 no. You're 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 absolutely right. So the question is, how strong is that? I think that's yeah. a million dollar question because we're being told these polls about what the Israeli people want or what they're thinking. We can't really trust these polls because they're coming from the Israeli government or from Israeli media. Like uh, the Israeli government has officially taken over Haaretz. Haaretz used to be the left wing uh, newspaper. They used to be sympathetic to Palestinians. You've noticed a 180 shift in that mag in that newspaper. Nothing to do with probably the original uh, curators of that magazine. It's because there, there's been a, a complete emergency order takeover from the Israeli government on these media companies. So we don't know what Israelis are thinking right now. That's the problem. We don't know how they feel. They don't know how we, they, they don't know how each other feels. It's just it's another way of kind of controlling the uh, the the atmosphere in a country during times of war. So it's a, it's an issue because if if it, if Israelis, your typical Israeli is not on board with this, there is no way of other Israelis to know that other than word of mouth because social media is being shut down. So, you know, that's the other tragedy of the, of all this is that Israelis may not be down for this at all, but we're told that they are. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, but but we do see the protests. There are massive, massive protests. And they're not about a ceasefire, dude. They're about yeah. getting the hostages back. And they're, you know, about removing Netanyahu. Just yeah. Netanyahu, not the government, just BB. Just um, BB. Yeah. You know, yeah. So I, I do think it's a mischaracterization to say, well, I don't think it's a mischaracterization, but I, I do think you have to assume just as someone who's trying to do a strategic analysis of this, uh, that it's the majority of the population. It might See, be a that's small a, majority, but, it's, right. well, but it, it, that, yeah. that's where I, I reserve, I reserve myself. I reserve myself on that right. fact because I cannot say, because it would be dangerous to assume that they all feel that way just in case the reality is the opposite. But at the same time, you might be right. In which case I'm being naive and I'm assuming that maybe there's a reasonable majority, a reasonable silent majority. But it, either way, it's a billion dollar question. Is there a silent majority in Israel? We would never know that just the way things are engineered. So I reserve my assumptions that the majority of the population does feel this way, even though I may be wrong about it. But I you know, have you, to reserve you, it. You hate to judge, you hate to, you hate to, to judge a, a, a country's opinion or a people's opinion based off their TikTok videos. But exactly. If I, if I was if I was going to. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 Very and, true. And here, here's something that I want to point out. When we when we see white phosphorus shot on multiple plate in multiple sectors of Gaza, and then shot in multiple sectors of Lebanon, that's not just some rogue actor commander who's just like lost his shit. That speaks. And correct me if you think I'm wrong travis that speaks to like an instant unspoken institutional practice that uh that that's like trans divisional that, that no that, those, know, those shells yeah those, those shells cost way more they're stored differently they're transported differently that's a conscious decision you know it's a conscious decision to even arm you know to even have those in the field on the howitzers and then you know obviously to fire them uh at at targets like the like they're firing them at that requires that requires high clearance you know there's no there's no lieutenant there's, there's no, well, <laughs> there's, there's no rogue commander. There's no, there's no, rogue uh, you know, there's, no there's no PL on the gun. There's line. no rogue Travis out there. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, rank, the rank structure names don't, don't, don't apply very well here, but yeah, like there's, there's no platoon leader level artillery officer going, yeah, sh shoot, let's shoot some Willie Pete into Gaza. That's gotta be, that's gotta be higher, higher plan, higher clear. There's no way. The, the a big mistake I see Americans who had take a pros yeah. really position on, especially and, people and, No, go ahead. No, and I just wanted to just reiterate one more time. It's both in Gaza and southern Lebanon, completely two different uh, zones of the yeah, combat. Two, yeah, different two, units, yeah. two, two, probably, I assume, two different entire like commands uh, that are managing both operations. So, how is that not institutional where they're getting these clearances to do this? I don't yeah, know. It, uh, I, I I have to look at. I don't. I'm not as familiar with the with the with the the fire the fire the the white phosphorus usage in Lebanon. Obviously, them firing into Lebanon is problematic for all those reasons. Got it. Um, but you know, one 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 conventional, relatively acceptable use of white phosphorus is to 
is to block, you know, observation with smoke screens. If you thought you were being directly targeted, using it in an open area to stop that isn't necessarily problematic. Now, I have no idea what they actually did with it because, again, I'm not familiar with those two missions. They did they fire it into uh, a town uh, like they do in Gaza? Because what they do in Gaza, there is no, there's absolutely zero military explanation, excuse, whatever. Oh no, 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 we, yeah. we. There's, there's no good reason. Yeah, to fire we, we have a geolocation. Uh, I, I, yeah. Yeah, no, no, we have ge geolocated, uh, identifiable off landmarks footage of it being in multiple towns. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, so that's not what I'm talking about. That's yeah. not what I'm talking about, then. <laughs> yeah, right. So, yeah, I yeah. mean, yeah, we talked about the... Uh... Oh, go ahead, Mark. Well, just given what you guys just said about how there is no logical military... There's no military precedent, at least under the conventional, you know rules of engagement or how we uh, how america conducts warfare at least in, in the past few years so we've already established that that should tell us how this will probably go so you we're all all three of us are sitting here analyzing this from common sense former military guys perspective i think that's a problem that all three of us are doing right now we have to start kind of thinking outside that box if we want to kind of give it somewhat of an accurate picture of what might happen because we know that they're not operating with you know sound military strategy um on all different types of levels so the question lies is let's okay let's step outside that box for a second and let's see what's on the horizon of something that might be more insane that they might do and like i said i'm gonna home back in on the possibility of you know incorporating the dehia doctrine they're their possible motivation may be just to cause as much civilian suffering as possible. So I'm going to hone back to that. I'm going to step outside the, uh, you know, the, the, the strategic, you know, line of thinking oh, I, and more on the, the here. I, I, I agree with you because the, the only way, actually one of the only ways that their actions in Gaza make any sense is if that's their goal, right? Yeah. If your goal is to quote unquote uh, rescue hostages and, and defeat Hamas, then aerial bombardment, and leveling of 60% of the city makes no sense because yeah. that won't make either of those missions easier to accomplish. It won't be easier to get your hostages and it won't be easier to target Hamas when you turn Gaza into Stalingrad, right? Now, if your goal is to actually destroy Gaza, then yeah, what they're doing, doing a great job. Yeah, what you're doing accomplish. Makes sense. yeah, and that's why I've never bought, you know, well, I don't think any of us have, I've never bought your stated, I've never bought your stated goals because you're not, you're not yeah. making sound decisions to accomplish those. Now, if, if your if your secret goal or your unspoken goal is to level Gaza and inflict as much you know uh, su uh, civilian harm as possible, then you're going about that the right way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're actively trying to do ethnic cleansing, yeah, you've checked off all the boxes. Yeah, uh, preventing I, I, food from I, I, coming I, I, in. Yeah, I fully agree with you. I think that that's 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 the vein, that's the lens that you, you almost have to analyze this with. Is like, okay, what's what's the act? If I'm if they're doing X, what is the actual goal there? Because it, X doesn't match. The state it doesn't match the state admission so what's the actual mission right yeah yeah and, and here's the, here's the thing with the uh the rafa assault that's also part of this um it, it's they're doing the diet doctrine with egypt they're trying to create a humanitarian situation or the threat of a humanitarian situation that's so dire that egypt will feel compulsed to open to, to accept the refugees from Rafa into the buffer zone that they're currently constructing. So um, that's just part of that as well. I, I think um, when it comes to, to Lebanon, I mean, it's what we've been saying since uh, they did that targeted strike in uh, Beirut in uh in december against the uh the, the hamas commander uh that was uh living there uh they're trying to draw the u.s into the war that's that's been a part of the conversation for like three months now that's what i wanted to hone in on too is as our next topic is talking about okay what is the likelihood travis or or greg is of us being dragged into this i mean it's hard to know but is it what's the probability what's the possibility of it the, the one i the one i can see um, the one I could see, and I can't see ground forces. That makes that makes no sense. Definitely, to me. definitely not. I don't no, think but are we talking like tomahawk happen. missiles, like what they did? Yeah, with Yemen? I mean, even strikes, which you know, like it's hard to say. Oh, that won't happen. Well, it's happening, and just yeah. not there. Um, 
but the the one when you were, we were talking about flooding the zone, we were talking about ways that you defeat, you know, air defense uh, bubbles. Well, if that started happening and that air defense bubble started getting overwhelmed, I am that's one of the ones that I can see as plausible as well, because because of what's going on in the Red Sea already. There's there's you know three destroyers and one uh, one cruiser sitting there, you know, in the region. Yeah. Uh, and what are and what are destroyers and crew in, in U.S. Navy cruisers great at? They're great at air defense. That's one of their primary capabilities. Yeah. And so I could sure. see them. I could see them being used potentially to shoot down to shoot down you know incoming ordnance. Um, they don't now. Granted, that same capability is not an offensive capability. That's their you know theater ballistic missile launch systems and missile launch systems. But their air defense capacity, they could arguably function you know as a defensive air defense umbrella without without actually escalating fires into anywhere else that 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 seems plausible to me yeah but it also worries me though this is the part oh i'm, I'm not the idea does not thrill me, yeah, more and, and, me and if we're not i mean the, the the idea that we get dragged into this this is the terrifying thought is no it's actually kind of unthinkable because well our warships are in, are vulnerable now like our, our, it's a there is a we you know we're very confident in our military capabilities but the risk of putting any of our warships in danger from a from a Hezbollah cruise missile that can like flooding that just like they can flood Israel's defenses air defense systems they could flood a warship's air defense systems yeah and that's, that's what terrifies me I don't do. yeah I don't want our boys and girls to go down for this shit now, granted, like, that's you a part know, of our, our, our US 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 ships integrated air defense Aegis system is significantly better than than that same overwhelm attack that worked against Russian capital ship. However, right. it still works. That's still it can still work. That. All it takes is one. And any just, ship any ship missiles are a real freaking risk, and you know that yeah. because the Navy, U.S. Navy, is treating them like they are a very serious risk and rapidly trying to develop technologies yes. uh, to, to counter them. Yeah, they're a real threat. That's you know you can't argue against that because the Navy wouldn't argue against it. And when you think about it mathematically, all it takes is for one, one of those missiles to hit one of the ships, sink it. We lose hundreds, if not thousands of U.S. men, men and women. And now we're officially dragged into it. Because yeah, now I, it's another 9-11 force. This is controversial in some circles, but I, while I, while I fully understand the reasons for doing it, I, I feel like the Houthi involvement, frankly, uh, has been counterproductive as far as I, I don't, I don't think, I, I question whether that's actually benef benefited Palestine because I think it, it, it pulled, I think it pulled a lot of uh, U.S. naval assets into the region that wouldn't have been there otherwise, and that con that concerns me. We'll see if anything comes of that, but that's the one piece that's that's concerned me the whole time. Is yeah, it concerns you, me. You too. brought that carrier because the carrier sits tends to sit around like Spain. It's, it tends to sit over in the western edge of the Mediterranean, but that's yeah. not where those four destroyers, the three destroyers, and one and one uh, cruiser are uh, since since the shipping lane stuff has gone on. They're they've been in they've been in the east, eastern Mediterranean or, or or Red Sea the entire time now. Yeah. yeah, but I do think that um, I'm not sure that they would uh, put even put themselves in that position. Like, um, if you look at what's going on in the Gulf of Aden, they're playing it very, you know, yeah. very safe. Uh, they're You're not, right. All they have, all they have to do is sit out a support distance, and then can't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think the the idea of putting boots on the ground uh, is kind of unthinkable. Um, yeah. I don't think I I, I don't believe that would ever at this happen. stage. No, not at all. Thank you. Because, because people this, are uh, be, because be, you know uh, be, because of the language, um, how especially in activism circles, uh, the U.S. and Israel are being conflated as the same entity. Uh, I feel like it's making people think that Israel and United States prosecution of a military campaign is the same, and it's not at all. Yeah. Like definitively, you can't. Uh, yeah, the the bombing of Baghdad, war crime, got it. Uh, but to, to conflate the targeting practices and the method of prosecution of the U.S. military and the Israeli military is uh, quite uh, in, insane from my perspective. I'm not celebrating the United States. No, agree. I mean, agree. Guys, that's, but like, you know, that, that's that's empirically yeah. that's empirically true. You know, you can again, you can you can have. Yeah. You can have your feelings about it, but it's empirically true by the numbers, by the numbers, by the methodologies. Yeah. They they are not even remotely the same in practice, uh, in execution, in planning, and targeting. Not at all. Yeah, yeah. and you, you have to you have to also bear in mind that the United States military um, is you know interested in long term deterrence and like threat prevention, and there's a lot of other shit going on right now that that the Middle East. 
a lot, uh, you know, the um, general, like general officers have come out publicly re- saying that, you know, they think there's going to be a de-escalation. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has definitively said they don't want to get into it with Iran, and Iran no, doesn't want I, to get into it with the U.S. I think, and, both, and that's I think both, obviously true. Yeah, I think both sides have very clearly signaled that they are not trying to escalate this. You, you, you touched on this, Craig, a few days ago. Or, you know, um, the the U.S. basically said, "Hey, we're going to hit a we're going to hit a bunch of targets, so you might want to move your guys." And you know, those target sites were mostly uninhabited uh, when they were hit. You know, and, and and likewise, you've seen, you know, you've seen a reduction in 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 escalatory behavior by Iran's proxies. Clearly, both sides are clearly backing away from that from that standoff. Yeah, that was one. That was a. No, no, go ahead, man. No, that was one thing that was uh, kind of a a relief to see was Iran not wanting to get involved. Uh, it goes to show that they're not trying to escalate it, you know, to play into the whole narrative. This is going to be like a World War Three. So that was a relief to kind of see. I don't know how much to take that seriously, but it was somewhat of an indicator, you know. Um, well, the, the, the U.S. doesn't want to uh, doesn't yeah. want to escalate. Only a few freaking insane neocons like freaking Lindsey Graham and Mike Lindsey Graham want <laughs> want a freaking bomb. Bomb, 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 Iran situation. Yeah. Uh, because w- what those idiots don't realize or what they apparently don't realize is that U.S. military assets in Levant are incredibly vulnerable. Like yeah. militias, militias shot 18 rockets at a U.S. base and two got through. That's just 18. Like the rocket capabilities yeah. of Iran are freaking Imagine insane. a swarm. Like Imagine they, a swarm. Can, yeah. So – yeah, and then if the U.S. responds, uh, couldn't defeat Iran at this point, like not without a massive like invasion. And even then, the, you know that the U.S. military is saying like, "Hey, we have a fucking recruiting crisis. We've got a bunch of other issues right now. We don't. We're, we're not getting involved in another land war in South South Europe. Uh, you know, South Asia. But um, you know, we could damage Iran's." Inf- infrastructure the economic centers with a bombing campaign that they've been trying to like build up over the past 10 years in response to western sanctions so it just doesn't make sense for uh, escalation nobody wants an escalation and the smart money in the in the levant in the middle east is on de-escalation regional de-escalation because there are a lot of business interests um you know capital management companies with diverse portfolios that are not just responsible to the defense sector. You know, there's this Mumbai to Europe pipeline that's massively important to a lot of international interests. You know, it starts in Mumbai, goes to, uh, you know, Abu Dhabi or Dubai, and then goes through Saudi Arabia on trains into Jordan and leaves out of Haifa and Ashdod to Europe. So that's what this whole normalization deal is about. So um, if Bibi and his uncontrollable government start fucking with transnational interests um i'm not sure how much more value they have even despite the massive zionist lobbies so that's another strategic consideration that i don't hear a lot of people talking about no, because I'm, the money is actually on de-escalation I, I, have right, hard, keep- I have a hard time accepting i have a hard time accepting any argument that they've been that israel's been a benefit to u.s to, you know to u.s strategic interests in a long time, if if ever, I, I've never I've never bought that argument because I've never seen any definitive positive that wouldn't be outweighed by better relationships with everyone in the region besides them. I, I just don't I don't see how that works geopolitically. And what an example of that. And here's where I think that that mentality began with the U.S. military was the uh, bombing of the barracks in Beirut that killed the Marines. Right mm-hmm. now, what's interesting about that situation, the reason why that's important for this topic um, and current where we are now is because there was a book that was released called By Way of Deception, and it was a huge expose and scandal. Uh, it, it got to the point where Israel actually was able to get the book banned in the United States. They actually had a court order to ban it. Well, the problem is, obviously, with free speech, that ban was overturned by another court. But that book was an ex Mossad agent who basically write, wrote in, in a complete expose about the internals of the Mossad. Mentioned in that book, that book actually caused a rift between the U.S. the U.S. government and the U.S. military with the Israeli military, because what happened was the Israelis had prior knowledge to the bombing of the of the uh, the barracks in Beirut that killed Marines. 
Now, when that book was released, it it was the first time it was ever officially revealed that they knew about it, and they chose not to inform or warn the Marine Corps that this was going to happen. So by doing that, it was Israel Israel indicated, you know, unknowingly that they they don't see American lives as valuable. They don't see American troops as valuable. So that that situation, the Beirut bombing, that was huge. That was pivotal. That was the deviation point from U.S. military loyalty to Israel. And we're now suspicious of them. Like, OK, you guys don't really give a fuck about us. And the logic behind that was the strategy that the Mossad had was if we don't tell them and they die, maybe it will drag them into a war because they lost Marines. Well, Reagan didn't follow that. They, he didn't follow that path that they expected him to. He wound up saying, no, nah, I'm going to pull them out, which Israel was not expecting. But either way, that that book uh, created a huge rift. Yeah. And we're seeing that play out in the mentality of, you know, and just the attitude of U.S. soldiers, um, servicemen and women and generals. Um, and I think Greg touched on this in one of his videos that they're wary of this. So, you know, how that's going to play out now is the question. It's like, OK, we've done this before. You try to drag us into this war with Lebanon before. It didn't work then. The question is, will it work now with the current administration making very stupid moves? And the key word that, Greg, you said the problem, the the the. The problem you said in your last statement was you used the word smart. And that's that's yeah, yeah. completely not what we're seeing out of the Biden administration. So that's why I'm more of a pessimist on this shit. You guys are thinking more logical. I'm thinking more. No, I, I just I don't I don't I don't disagree with you. I don't think the Biden administration is being dumb. I think the Biden administration is being bought. You know, that yeah. looks like that looks like bought and paid for behavior. But, you know, to me, you know, granted, yes. we, you know, there are. There are certain officials in the administration that are very Zionist and have always been up, up to and including the president. Right. You know, at least by by, by word and deed, um, you know, but when you look at the when you look at our government writ large, you know, the amount of APAC penetration is so freaking high that it just looks like bot behavior to me. When you watch politicians who on every other issue in every other place would be like, that's a genocide. You know, we should stop giving weapons to that group. But here there's carte blanche. Well, yeah, yeah you know, that's convenient that you. You have that one blind spot and you also took 200k from APAC mm -hmm. this year right so it just looks like to me it looks like bought and paid for behavior yeah yeah very mm -hmm. much so because there's no logic in it if the, if you see actions from a politician where that don't have any logic or yeah. benefit and any, any other way then you're saying okay this is yeah um i wanted to talk about okay in worst case scenario, let's just lay out a worst case scenario. We're we're taking kind of so I I, I, guess, I guess work. Oh yeah, no, no. Sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. The lag here is causing yeah. It looked like it looked, that looked no, like we were on a delay. Yeah, send it like <laughs> what we're, we're yeah. I know. Yeah, my bad. Um, okay, um, so yeah, I mean, we are kind of taking the optimistic road. Uh, I I guess. I mean, I still think it's entirely possible that they can do something incredibly stupid because. From my perspective, it's been like that since day one. Um, right. But so that's, this kind of does seem like an in, inconceivable move, like bombing Beirut. Like, could you imagine the geopolitical consequences of just like bombing the shit out of, you know, a, a, a metropolitan center in well, another country that they're technically not at war with? I also want to point out that I also want to point out that if, if they chose to, and I think they've honestly, I think they played a very politically smart game so far. But if they chose to, Hezbollah doesn't have to invade Israel to escalate this again, they've got plenty of weapon systems, you know, direct yeah. fire weapon systems with four to 10 kilometer ranges on them. They yeah. don't have to cross the line to, to hit inside and they already have hit inside. So, yeah. And, uh, so yeah, you were saying, given the actions we're seeing in Gaza, this is, we also have to, you know, entertain the possibility that the actions we're seeing with the military is connected to the fanatical ideology of the regime itself. We cannot separate the two. This has been the mistake, I think, for a lot of commentators on this whole issue is that they're separating the fanatical ideology of the people in Bibi's cabinet from its actions. Me, I see a, a, a nice unhindered pipeline. I see a clear pipeline between the two. For example, you see the actions of the military in Gaza. It looks like bloodlust revenge. It, you know, we've seen the Amalekite um, invocation, right? Well, let me just give you a little hint that this is possibly what we're seeing, this 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 uh, provocation with, uh, with Lebanon. It may be indeed related to some type of weird fanatical ideology. And again, this may be out there. This may be pessimistic. This may be, you know, beyond us. But let's just pretend it's not for a second. So... 
there we, we know that Bibi's cabinet is full of religious fanatics, people who see what's happening against Palestinians as almost like a biblical divine revenge that they do. They're they're living the past, the previous victories of the Bible. Well, there is there is this same group that believes in this. They also believe in the destruction of Damascus. It's a biblical thing. Isaiah 17 is an often used um, scripture. A point in scripture where these fanatics will use to justify an attack on Lebanon. They invoke the ancient Damascus. Uh, and if you read Isaiah 17, it talks about uh, Damascus being nothing but rubble. So there are fanatics who actually read these and use it in their strategies of, uh, uh, especially with when you incorporate settlers who are in the IDF, they use these Bible verses before they go to war in Gaza. We've seen that. Um, yeah. Greg, you pointed out a situation where we saw. I've, an seen, I've, seen, I've seen Crusader shit in the U.S. Army before. You know, every yeah, time, every time I told Army. him, I thought mm -hmm. that was absolutely ridiculous and to cut that shit out. But uh, I think we've all seen it at least once, once or twice. One of my good friends, he's an ex-Marine and he's he's a he's a Zionist. He he's one that kind of pointed that out to me that he believes it's Isaiah. 17 that what we're about to see happen in lebanon and it's the invocation and i can read just one verse of it a prophecy against damascus see damascus will no longer be a city but will become a heap of ruins the cities of orar will be deserted and left to no flocks which will lie down and no one will make them afraid fortify city will disappear from ephraim so it goes on and on about the uh biblical destruction of damascus while you guys might laugh at that and not take it seriously, I mean, I'm not laughing at it. I was just going to say, uh, if if uh, if 06, 2006 happens again, I want I want you to bring I want I want that guy to come on the show. I want that guy yeah. to come on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, but, uh, and and you know, I always do hate I do hate when people mix scripture and military tech <laughs> strategy, but. Um, yeah, I mean, there there definitely is a, a massive fanatical element within the army, and it's not just with the Joes, with the dumbass privates who are like dancing around playing grab bass, singing like "We'll kill yeah. the sons of Amalek." You know, um, no, it's 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 throughout every echelon of the society. Well, it has to be. They're carrying orders. out the orders that they're being um, given. They're, they're yeah. carrying out the orders they're being given. Yeah. None of us, none of us would follow those orders. You, you're telling me to collapse no. to no. collapse apartment buildings to do to do any of this shit? I wouldn't do any of that stuff. You know, no. so you you there has no, to be it's, it's an unlawful order. There's got to be a channel going down through to your point. Um, that's got to be true. Otherwise, they wouldn't be executing, you know, blatant war crimes like that. They were like they were normal military orders. Yeah, because they're it's, not. It, yeah. So so because we're talking we're talking because we're talking about fanaticism. I do want to talk about morale um, uh, in this last section. Uh, because that's got to be an issue. Now, I want to play this uh, video. It's, it's in Hebrew, so I'm going to have to uh, narrate it again. Uh, but it's this rabbi on a far-right uh, channel uh, just saying that we got 300,000 like, chosen... The, the look on Greg's face so, right now, frozen. I think we lost it. There we go. Come back. I think we got you back. All right. So here we go. There are 300,000 people back from the battle together. We are coming and still, I don't know what's next for us. We still have Lebanon. We still have Rafa. We still have, we still have a lot. So basically what you are saying is there is a gap between what's happening on the ground and all these crazy protests calling for it to end. On the ground, you can feel what I see is a victory. I see we are destroying infrastructure. We don't have a single, we see hundreds of thousands the Nakba in exile, I can see. In my own eyes, there is a tractor. And here I come back to people and people are like, what? And all that? Hold on. So maybe you could set straight. We just saw a source section, a section on Channel 12 uh, speaking about reservist soldiers that are feeling desperate from the fighting uh, and are left feeling neglected. So what are the reservists really feeling about the war? The rabbi says... I don't know about which reservists he's talking about. The reservists that I'm with, um, that are with us, uh, they want war and they want to fight. And now all the teams and on WhatsApp groups, we want Rafa. We Everyone is saying, we want Rafa. We want Rafa now. Right now, I can pull out my phone and show you. We want Rafa. So that was from, um, sorry, he was speaking very quickly, so I was having to read it. But that's from a IDF uh, rabbi. Yeah. And that's not that's not rare. That's very common in the IDF. There's a famous uh, military school. Um, I believe one of one of even the um, the head chaplain 
uh, rabbi of yeah. the uh, IDF, he actually justified uh, rape during warfare. He actually said that if you rape a Gentile during warfare, it may be useful for morale. This is a chaplain. Now, my dad was a chaplain. I cannot imagine that in the U.S. military. Yeah, I've known some so, weird chaplains. I've never heard anything say say anyone. Yeah, any of them say anything like that. Yeah, that's but that's a fact. Yeah. He's the head of he's the head chaplain of uh, the IDF currently, and he said that it, it's uh, rape during warfare is justifiable if it helps morale. So that gives you an idea of the fanaticism that goes on. Um, the question is, how far up the chain of command does that go to the point where actual military decisions, based on like, you know. A very high, a very large scale military military decisions are made. That's the question. You, we don't know. Well, he, the sky's the limit. Well, here, here, here's the problem when, when you have things like that. You know, uh, a senior officer may go to the rabbi and be like, "Hey, how's morale?" Or like a fanatical, like senior NCO, be like, "Hey, how's morale?" And of course, it's going to be like everyone's raring to go. Hezbollah, Iran, like let's roll them back, yeah. sir. Let's like, get some. Do you feel like that's something? Yeah something you you would ex imagine happening oh i think we just lost travis yeah we lost travis shit no, that's fine right. oh it's fine back. yeah we'll cut him in there, there he is sorry minor interruption yeah okay he's still figuring out his camera i think all right so um can you hear us yeah i can hear you i can hear and see you Okay, um, so yeah, I mean, they could, they could be giving us up, up like false reports about like troop morale and composition, but like we we've also seen cracks um, in the window, you know, because we, Israeli hospitals have reported like an increase in mental health issues, and yes, uh, you have guys testifying in front of the Knesset saying like we can't stop hearing the bombs or the RPGs and stuff like that, so. You, you can't have guys you can't have guys operating in sector like they've been operating for as long as they've been operating where they're taking where where Hamas is getting is infiltrating them to the level that they are getting getting as close as they are getting getting off you know yes uh, RPG shots you know AT, AT RPG shots on yeah you know Yassin shots on armor armored vehicles and 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 guys getting hit by snipers at will uh, and I'll tell you what the other another thing that I know from experience is a huge um, morale deleter is the employment of uh, EFPs. You know, we saw multi-array or we saw array explosively formed penetrators being put in and used against um, Israeli armor too. And those things, those, those things are crew deletes. They kill entire crews. So yeah. to me, to me, I, he can say whatever he wants about telegram channels. The Russians have a bunch of kick in telegram channels, even though they've got 200,000 bodies going back too, because the idiots on telegram aren't fighting the war. Uh, so I, yeah. I do I do not I do not buy that the force that the Israeli you know armed forces hasn't been negatively uh, impacted morale wise. That's, that's BS. well. So here's this yes. this top this topic that we're talking on right now is one of those things that uh, is an X factor in the information warfare here because I talk to friends who are you know in Israel proper and they tell a whole different story than what we're fed and obviously in the Western media and we are like Greg said we're seeing the cracks. Greg has no idea how true he is right now when he says that. And what there has been, uh, like Greg was talking about how when you start shooting civilians, like in cold blood, the psychological effect it has on you when you go back home is irreparable. You cannot, you cannot, and that's why during the, you know, during the Holocaust, they had to switch the gas, you know, uh, sw switch to Zyklon B instead of, as opposed to bullets. Well, yeah. that, that, that principle that Greg was talking about is playing out right now. In Israel, for example, and this, you won't hear this in Western media, but there's been multiple instances in Israel proper where IDF soldiers have came back, fucked up in the head, probably because they're so used to just killing civilians willy nilly without any repercussions that they've gotten in arguments at restaurants, fancy restaurants in Israel, pulled out their gun and just shot people. So we have active shootings going on in Israel right now that you will never hear about unless you're talking to someone who lives over there uh, happening on, on the regular. So this, my prediction right now in Israel is that we are going to see a psychological breakdown of the population happening in very visceral detail that we, that you can't, you will simply won't be, they're able to hide it right now because there's a firewall around Israel, you know, and getting, letting information get out, but it's going to get to a point where it's not going to be able to uh, there, be so. There's also, and there's also, yeah, I totally agree with you. And there's also, there's also going to be an isolation wall around Israel. So. You know, for the ones that, you know, maybe maybe you're 
maybe you're a, a settler or something and you live in a remote area and all you ever interact with are Israelis anyway, not as big of a deal, but to any of them, to any of them that have, you know, international, any kind of international involvement, families, relationships, friends online, social media, whatever, you know, the U.S. is the only country not voting against them right now. Like the, the, the global response is massively negative towards them. Yeah. And there's no way there's no way the more the more worldly of them aren't feeling it. You know? Yeah. So what happens when they go back home? What happens yeah. when they go back to France or Spain and everybody knows that they served in Gaza? That alone right now. When you're in the heat of battle and you're in here and you're going through this sadistic peer pressure on the ground in battle with your fellow soldiers shooting civilians at that point right now, it's fun for them, but that fun's going to end. And then the silence is going to creep in. It's the silence that kills you. And we've barely scratched the surface on that happening. Yeah. And, and not to mention, uh, what, that's a good point. When they stop fighting in Gaza and they go back to wherever they came from uh, and people are they're, they're going to be like socially isolated, especially mm -hmm. like. A year from now, uh, two years from now, he's going to be like, when, the, when, when the shooting when the shooting stops and the UN and the UN and international and NGO teams go into Gaza and start really piecing together, you know, uh, empirically, you know what what happened there? Because I mean, I, Greg said this before, but you know, the UN's terrible at starting it's, the UN's terrible at stopping genocides and stuff while they're in progress, but they're great at doing you know post mortems on them. Yep. Yeah, they're they're yeah they're great they're great at doing the, the, the post analysis and figuring out exactly who did what where they're really good at yeah. that and so and, I think uh, you know, we, we we know ten we know ten percent of what's happened in there I think yeah and and, yeah. And, and and when and when that goes when that goes live when that finally gets out there and they're back in Europe or back in North America um, war is isolating as it is I, I guess a genocide is even more isolating so. Yeah. Um, the, stu the suicides are really, really going to start. Um, yep. you know, not you not thought, just suicides. Our numbers were bad in the not U.S. Just, uh, not, no, not just suicides. Is yeah. We're talking also active active shootings. We're talking about uh, murder suicides that are happening. Those yeah. have already started happening in Israel right now. I saw, I saw a couple of those. I know what you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, but you would never see it on CNN or Fox or, you know, Hot Eretz or anything like that. So what I've heard... I can't imagine how much, how many more are going on that they've managed to kind of, you know, keep under the rug for now. But it's only a matter of time. So you're doing, you're so take yeah. a situation like that that we're already in, and then trying to now take that morale and apply it to a war with Hezbollah. Yeah, I mean, they'll just like crack under the pressure. We already see guys fighting, like getting fist fights over food. Um, mm -hmm. You know, beating the literally, we, we have videos of them beating the shit out of each other, like rape on rape on an off. Yeah, uh, freaking gang rapes are now coming out uh, against know, of, fellow soldiers, against fellow against female fellow idea of soldiers. Yeah, there there is a report already a reported high sexual assault incident incidents in the in the IDF even prior to October. Yeah, uh, I remember seeing that. You know, I mean, the, all, all militaries have that problem. The U.S. has that problem, but they're, they're, well, the, rate, the rate of sexual assault yeah. against against female IDF members is, is apparently super high. Well, when you have the head chaplain saying that it's okay in warfare, yeah. so yeah, you know. it, it, and the, the the culture itself is uh, obsessed with rape. Uh, it's just it's going to happen. But yeah, so you're right. Taking that uh, that morale issue to fight a more technologically and less limited. Uh, more technologically advanced and less limited uh, enemy, a combatant like Hezbollah, which, by the way, is the most powerful non-state military force on the planet. Uh, it's it, it seems like a loser. But of course, coming back to our, our first premise when we started, I'm not sure they're in touch with that. They, they have a training problem. They have a doctrine problem. They have an execution problem. They have a morale problem. And they have a whole string of political problems. So it's not like the best place to launch, to open up a second front. The only re the only way I can see them doing that or a way of kind of convincing themselves that it is going to work is if they're about to roll out some type of military technology that has not been utilized yet. They have talked about using the iron beam, for example. Uh, there could, and that's a question I have you, Travis. Is it possible that maybe they think they have a trick up their sleeve they have an extra card to play that we don't know about yet because they haven't used it we know that israel I mean, I don't is, think so. what is that anyway an ada ada laser 
I don't know. It's a, it's a short range. I know it's a lot shorter range than the Iron Dome, but I'm just kind of using that as an example. So, like, in what if Israel? Yeah, very- that's a, so that's a um, the, the 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 U.S. Navy's been 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 experimenting with those uh, land systems too. But yeah, it's an it's a air defense. It's an air defense laser system. Yeah. So is it possible that so they that's, have... that's that's like basically zero power projection, by the way, because it's even shorter range than Iron Dome. It, the bubble doesn't yeah. even extend into into Lebanon. Uh, yeah. yeah. So the only thing I can think of, like I said, yeah. that's my only reasoning is that they might employ some technology that has not been utilized yet that they have in their back pocket that they're just going to think that it's going to be very effective, like do a shock and awe thing. That's, and that's just me speculating way. Out yeah. I, I highly, I highly doubt it. And here's why, right. Clearly, clearly munitions were an issue since we had, since the U S almost say we, since the U S had to ship munitions, you know, or ship munitions multiple times already uh, to Israel because they're running out of shells. Um, you're not, you're not using, you know, you're using up 750 pound dumb ordinance because that's what you have. Um, so I'm not saying I don't, I don't think they have the capacity to hit, but I don't think they have any aces in their sleeve. Maybe not. Maybe not. what they've been using already. What they've been using already is arguably top tier equipment, sort of it's top tier equipment, poorly employed and arguably poorly supported. But you know, the current Merkava is, you know, the current, uh, current level of tank armor, et cetera. So I was just about to talk about the Merkava, this, uh, the age we're living in right now, 2006, I call it the rise and fall of the Merkava tank. It was, uh worship it's, the rise, it's the rise and fall of all tanks right now our, our it armor, is it is heavy 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 armor heavy armor doesn't own the battlefield currently exactly and that's mm-hmm. that's one of the biggest changes we've seen as a result of the ukraine war but yeah. we we as the, the world stage uh the population of the planet we we saw that with the ukraine war but if we had been paying attention to the white papers from 2006 we would have known that prior that the tank is not the big bad boy on the street anymore like it was in World War II or even the Cold War. So, I mean, m- military might used to be rated in tank divisions. That was the way you used to rate your military might on the ground. But we're and, but now the ace in the hole that Israel had was, well, it's composite armor. It's not steel armor, so it has more capability. No, we're realizing that composite armor is is getting at it's well, it doesn't matter. Out. It doesn't matter because those 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 tandem, those multi-stage those multi-stage, you know, uh, uh, penetrators are designed to penetrate explosive and composite armor, right? They're literally built yeah. for it. Um, yeah, I totally, I totally agree with you. Now, granted, their employment, it's not that you can't use mechanized infantry forces, but you can't, you sure as shit can't use them that way. And you yeah. can't use, you can't use armor solo because, yeah, I totally agree. Armor is way, way more, um, you know, the, the threat to armor is way, way higher. The AT systems are much more advanced. Even, again... You know the Russian side ones, the Iranian, uh, the Iranian side ones that Hezbollah arm is armed with. You know those used to be across the board, basically four kilometer or less engagement range, and they're not anymore. Several of them put, hit out, hit out to ten clicks, which is a long way. You know, yeah. and they're and they're optically guided. You know, they're camera guided. Um, they're advanced systems. They don't have the same top down attack capability uh, that you see from, uh, you know, from 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 NATO's AT necessarily uh a yeah. couple of them have have a have a kind of a higher angle approach but they don't have the high up uh you know come down approach that uh, like javelin has and stuff like that but it's but you don't you don't 100 need that either you yeah. know if you're getting direct hits you're still you're still gonna you're still gonna have effects so yeah i mean there's there's something incredibly uh democratizing about this new weapon uh this new missile and drone tech uh mm-hmm. that's happened o- over the past 15 years that's made you know a lot of these heavy hitting mech units armored units no longer a thing like yes a freaking dismounted infantry force like hezbollah can you know take out an armored division hell the the, the special forces did it in the opening days of the iraq war with you know yeah divisions, so i i don't think they can take out an armored division but but it's the the advance is much more costly. The cost is much much higher. It's, you know what? You're okay. So let's qualify that. If you use an armored division the way that they're currently using armor, then yeah, you're absolutely you could lose a whole division. You know, to Hezbollah, that's totally possible. If you're not you're not supporting it correctly, um, you don't have you know you don't have dismounts and mech infantry units working in concert. Um, you know, and the 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 drone capacity means that everyone can see everyone now, and so you know your speed of advance and things that used to kind of protect you in, in armored units. Um, you know, violence of attack, stuff like that doesn't work as well because everyone can see everyone. Yeah. So um, warfare's changed. They haven't adapted. 
They haven't adapted to, to uh, since 2006. The same issues that existed for the IDF still exist now, which, just to recap, is an over-reliance on bombing campaigns and air superiority, uh, a focus on spending a lot of time, money, and political energy on promoting an image of victory for the IDF and an image of defeat for Hezbollah. They implemented the Daia Doctrine, the collective punishment against civilians as opposed to directly targeting military forces, uh, which doesn't work. And, you know, they had shockingly undertrained and inexperienced ground troops, tank crews, trash, infantry, nowhere to be seen because, again, all their emphasis goes into the Air Force and pushing buttons. So, um, yeah, they, they want I, their deterrence capacity back, uh, and I'm not sure they're going to get it back. Uh, so I don't know where they're going to go with this, but a, a northern assault, I think we can just do a full circle and say it's completely strategically and operationally non-viable. Uh, the politicians still seem bent upon it, so uh, it's still a waiting game. Uh, Rafa is also something we, we talked about last week. Um, on the same type of episode about it being operationally non-viable, just a complete disaster. They're still saying that they uh, want to do it, but I, I guess that's where we stand right now. I, I don't. The, yeah. I, I kind of want to dive into the risk on the Israeli side. We're talking about Israel's objectives with has you know Hezbollah. Let's talk about Hezbollah's objectives with Israel. What are we looking at for Haifa? What does that look like? What does an evacuation of Haifa look like in all the northern cities? You know, I know for a fact that the uh, people living in those northern towns, even the ones that have not been evacuated, are extremely worried, um, you know, from from friends who have talked to me. What would an evacuation of like, obviously, uh, Greg, you pointed out that a number one attack point that uh, Hezbollah will go after will be the port because um, it cripples them economically, which is far more effective than what Israel might do to, say, southern Lebanon by shooting a bunker buster in one of the t in one of the tunnels. So what would an attack on Haifa look like and how would that even be evacuated? Well, I would just like to make one point. According to a CNN report that came out like two days ago, uh, apparently Israel's GDP and then the the fourth quarter of last year uh, shrank by 19 percent. So, um, yeah, yeah. Haifa would only exacerbate that massive economic blow. Um, but the thing is, I just want to circle to Hezbollah. That's, not, that's not what I would start. I, 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 would, I, would, I would go after air defense capacity if I was Yeah, done. I agree. I agree. I'd go after the Air Force mm -hmm. bases. Yeah, but I don't think Hezbollah wants an escalation either. Um, nothing they've done says they want an escalation. Um, uh, because what, they, what they've done over the past years has made uh, – not everybody agrees with it, uh, but they've kind of cultivated a rep reputation of like good governance, um, you know, uh, within the region. Uh, there's a lot of people who like Hezbollah um, and their first priority as a political entity is safeguarding Lebanon. They, they can say like our brothers in Hamas or whatever, and they could uh, they could give a red line to wh where they will open up a second front of what they said originally was if Hamas was ever under threat of being defeated, they'd open up. Um, now they, they've established other red lines, but their first responsibility and their first priority is to safeguard Lebanon. Even if their initial charter was to destroy the Zionist entity, it, it's really not in practice anymore. Well, no, that's something but, that but also, but also the best, the best way you can make the argument that the best way for them to help, for them to help Hamas and help Pal Pal Palestine is is to do what they're doing, which is keep pressure on so that Israel can't remove all units from the Lebanese border, but at the same time not escalate to the point where other other powers potentially, you know, the U.S. or somebody else gets more involved. And I think they've I think that's a balancing act that they've been playing. Uh, yeah. I agree with you that their principal their principal responsibility is is their their territory and their people. But um, I think they've been keeping they've been keeping pressure on without actually you know, stepping over the line and, 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 and authorizing, you know, hey, Israel's being invaded by, by Hezbollah now. So, you know, now other other Western forces are going to get involved and they haven't crossed that line. So I think that's totally purposeful. No, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I mean, they've been very clearly very good at escalation management. But you were talking about like Haifa, like the north. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, what, what would happen if they opened up with their rockets? Well, I mean, we've seen their own projections. I, I read an excerpt from that article that said it would just be completely devastating towards all of northern Israel. And, you know, yeah. it's potential. Like if, if they do engage 
uh, Hezbollah, they, they could be repelled and they could be rolled all the way back to the Galilee. I mean, it, it could be potentially disastrous. And a lot of yeah. uh, geopolitical analysts are now saying that uh, if they do attack, it will be the death of Israel as a state. Yeah. Not, not like doesn't mean like anyone's going to like be genocided like their propaganda says. It's just like the government, the regime that currently exists will be dismantled one way or another. Well, you look at what happened, what what already happened to the Israeli population <coughs> after October 7th. How many Israelis have fled Israel in the past few months? We I this is back in November. This and this is just November that half a million Israelis had fled the country. I don't know what the number is now, but even the ra the saber rattling between Hezbollah and Israel right now is enough to spook a lot of Israel Israelis out of Israel to, you know, um, wherever they can go, whether it be in Europe or, or the United States. So the question is, like, how much more are we going to see this mass migration out of Israel from the Israeli side because of this uh, saber rattling between Israel and Hezbollah? I, I imagine it's going to be it's going to send those numbers through the roof. I wonder how many of them are recent, you know, because I, I feel like if you grew up there, then this kind of stuff's been going on off and on or, you know, this 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 has happened multiple times before. But, you know, we have you a new move, generation. If you, now. Move there, if you move there after your, uh, you know, your birthright trip, you know, eight years ago, this might freak you out a little bit. Yeah. And that's actually a lot of them. In fact, a lot of settlers alone are. Yeah. They just they immigrated. They're not. Is, ya is Jacob is Jacob still there? Jacob the wise. Is he still there? Stealing stealing people's houses. Oh yeah, I'm sure he is. Well, no, he probably fled to his condo in New York City. He's back. He's yeah, back, no, in he's, back in he's Brooklyn. Back on Fifth Avenue. Dude, he's, <laughs> oh, he's, from, he's from Brooklyn, I think. Yeah. Yeah, no, he's he's definitely back in Brooklyn. There's no rocket attacks. There, there's no accusations of genocide. So. Yeah. He's over there with Mike Rappaport. Yeah. <laughs> filming filming TikToks. <laughs> did Did you see him? Uh, he was he just made a tweet because I'm on Twitter and it's horrible. But Michael Rappaport just said he he went to like a restaurant in Haifa and the people did said see like, apartheid. Yeah, yeah. He's like, we're Palestinian and you can't eat here. And he's like, this is apartheid. <laughs> After. After he literally was saying the most genocidal speech, of course you're going to get that reaction. Yeah, the only the only Michael Rappaport video I give a crap about is one where he got knocked out and told to shut the fuck up. What the what was it? A snowball that got thrown? Oh, great! <laughs> it was awesome. He's like, oh god, you fucking! Why would you post that afterwards? Yeah, just, that was that was. Help! Help! I'm being oppressed. Yo. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, do we have anything else we want to touch on before we like wrap up? We're at 90 minutes right now. We covered a lot. Uh, I have I could talk about this all day, but we did yeah. cover a lot with Travis. So, you know, in my opinion, guys, I'm going to give you my conclusion. I'm I'm going to be pessimistic out of rule of thumb. I'm going to assume that the worst is going to happen, um, and I'm hoping that you guys are right. So that's that's where I stand. You know, I just always reserve that motion of stupidity. Never underestimate the power of stupidity. It's there. So <laughs> yeah, that's where I'm at. You know. That's a valid point. Um, it makes no fucking sense. So I, I still believe in logic. So um, maybe and that I'm gives me comfort. One. Don't get me wrong. You guys <laughs> make me feel warm and fuzzy inside, especially, you know, uh, Sergeant and Major. Like you guys have made this specialist feel very safe uh, under your military wisdom. But you should, uh, <laughs> you should know by now that every time we do that, we're lying, though. You know? But, uh, <laughs> As no, your don't worry, it's all gonna be okay. As your subordinate, I have to be the uh, voice of balance here, <laughs> pessimist. Yeah, it's, it's a right specialist. Just take a knee, face outward, and drink water. All right, Sergeant. <laughs> yes, Sergeant. <laughs> oh God, don't, don't uh, just, <laughs> like flashbacks or some shit. <laughs> all right, yeah. So I think uh, that's where where it stands uh, right now. Just gonna have to wait and see for the next fucking ridiculous ass blunder to happen, and we shouldn't even be surprised anymore. But we probably still are gonna be because you know we st we're still sane. It means we're still sane. So um, yeah, I think uh, if, if if something else opens up, if a new theater, if a new conflict arises, we'll we'll do another one of these next week. But uh, yeah, that's uh that's a wrap, guys. Uh, thanks so much for coming on tonight and talking about this shit. Yep.
Um, just one, just one last closing thing for me. And this is more of like, um, sorry to get religious on you guys, but I'm, I'm praying that none of our men and women are going to be put in harm's way out in, out in the, uh, on the Red Sea or the Mediterranean. So if you're watching this and you are military or former military, you got military members, you know, uh, do your, you know, think along those lines, you know, if you're that spiritual nature, like we don't want our boys and girls sacrificing a damn body for this insanity. And that's where, that's where I'm at. You know, I care about our boys and girls, you know, I don't support the war machine, but I do support our boys and girls. And I don't want to see a damn one of them lose their lives over this fucking bullshit. So yeah, anyways, anyways. Yeah. I second the motion. All right. Well, I mean, I, it, it might happen because we're downhill with no breaks right now, but yes, because stupid, Hopefully. because of stupid. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's why you might be right. And then we're going to pray for that. And the resolution of this conflict and the bringing to justice of these, uh, murderous sons of sons of yep. bad things. Okay. But anyways, oh. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, see you guys next time. All right. We're out. I'll take care. Good talking to you, Mark. See you, Greg. you too. You too, Travis yeah. major major. Oh God. <laughs> God damn it. I had to do it. I had to God do it. Damn it. I was going to sneak it in there. Somewhere. No, <laughs> All right. I'm out. All right.